everybody and welcome to this week's coffee in the garden as you can see i am still not out in my garden yet i feel like it's every other week now but um we're supposed to get maybe even a sprinkling of snow tomorrow so uh we've got tea in a cozy spot instead we got peppermint tea today i'm not sure how it'll go down because i'm used to black tea but i've been eating a lot of peppermint candies to help my stomach um, so I'm hoping that maybe the peppermint tea will be kind of similar. So uh, I'm not going to take a sip of it yet because it's boiling hot. And the last time I did that, I embarrassed myself on camera. So uh, we'll just let it cool here over on the side. And uh, I'll introduce my topics for today. Um, today was a busy week. I will start off with that. And I will show you that I've got quite a bit to cover. Um, we're going to talk about beginning gardening and what to do if you want to grow your garden past just the beginning stage and if you're meaning if you want to get your garden bigger, um, requests that people sent me, um, we're going to talk about what our favorite thing to drink in the garden is, um, whether we trust others to weed our garden. Let's see if, uh, people are trusting or not. We're going to talk about growing canning staples. We're going to talk about perennials and having a section just for perennials. We're going to talk about managing pests. We're going to talk about everybody's favorite herbs that they uh, like to grow. Um, and I'll tell you how mine differ from the majority. We're going to talk a little bit about mushrooms. Um, we're going to have a little feature on chickens. And the last thing is, oops, I planted too soon, how to save your plants. So those are our topics today. And I'm going to start off, though, by telling you real briefly about my week. Um, it's been a busy week. My mom came to visit from Alaska, and she played with the kids and had a lot of fun. Helped me get caught up on dishes, which was just an absolute relief. And I'm very grateful for her because, ha, huh, so nice to be able to work in the kitchen without, like, feeling sick because of nausea from pregnancy and um, how dishes smell and things like that. All right. So, but I had a very busy week with her being here and doing just the visiting thing. Um, today is my husband's birthday, 39. Anyone else from 1983? Give me a like or a comment or something. And um, I was calling my old man because I was born in 89. Just enough of a difference there to uh, tease him about. And uh, let's see. I've been doing a lot of sewing. As a matter of fact, I'm working on a sewing project um, well, I'm, I'm working on my own sewing projects. I'm making Easter outfits for all the kids, but then I'm also working on, um, an Easter project for somebody else that saw my dresses and wanted me to uh, make one for her daughter. So we're going to do that and I'm going to be really busy. Uh, tomorrow I've got to take care of one of my chicken booties. Um, and not more on that in a little bit. And I've got to, I'm, I'm having my eight-year-old bake the bread tomorrow because I'm just too busy. Um, I've got uh, running around to do. i got to go over to the fabric store and all sorts of stuff. And with it being kind of snowy and not so great, uh, that's going to add to kind of the travel logistics. All right, so let's talk about beginning gardening. Um, and then we'll move on to all the little requests that people had. Uh, from Instagram. If you have a request and you're not on Instagram, leave it in the comments of any of my videos and I'll get to it, okay? Um, if you are on Instagram, find me at Tracy's Homestead and message me or comment on something anywhere and uh, I'll find it. I love to include people's requests in videos. And I try to put these videos out 8 a.m. on Friday morning, at least my local time. Um, so should be a regular thing. All right. Beginning gardening. What if you have been never gardened in your whole life and you're like, I'm going to grow something. Where do you start? Um, I have about four steps that I feel like you should do. Um, you might be able to kind of switch around the steps, do first, second, second, first, third, second, etc. But basically go with this just just to get started okay the first question is what do you want to plant 
You need to decide what do you want to grow? What do you think your family's going to use most? Do you guys love eating cherry tomatoes or do you guys hate eating cherry tomatoes? Are tomatoes just not a thing in your house? Tomatoes are such like, they, they have songs about it. Homegrown tomatoes by John Denver and all this stuff. Everybody wants to grow homegrown tomatoes, but if you don't like tomatoes, then don't grow tomatoes. If you like sugar snap peas, then it's sugar snap peas. If you really like lettuce, grow lettuce. If you hate lettuce and you just want to grow pumpkins for some reason, sure, go grow pumpkins. Find what you think is going to make your family the happiest or you personally happiest, and then go from there. Go look at the little seed carousels and pick maybe five. Just, just start with five, even if you don't buy them. Write down those five and then come back to step two. Step two, you're going to decide what location on your property, whether it's a little property or a balcony or inside your house or in 15 acres, what area of your property is going to work best for those kinds of plants. For example, tomatoes and peppers need a lot more sun than lettuce and broccoli, okay? And on the other hand, lettuce and broccoli will probably go to flower and then to seed, which is called bolting, if they're given way too much sun. So your location of your garden is going to be important. Um, in the Northern Hemisphere, planting on the north side of a structure is going to guarantee that almost nothing grows. Um, it's not going to get nearly enough adequate sunlight, etc. Um, whereas planting right against a structure on the south side is going to guarantee that you are going to get a lot of heat and whatever crop you need, whatever you're planting there needs to be able to handle some dryness because if you're like us, that area just gets dried out constantly. So um, slightly more tender might be on the east side of a, um, of a building. Um, slightly stronger could be on the west side. In the northern hemisphere, all of that, you know, that seems to be what works best for me. Okay, just as a simple thing. Um, if you're not sure how far apart to plant these things on the backs of the seeds, there is a distance, there's a guide. Um, I definitely suggest mapping it out on a piece of paper. Um, just kind of going, just bare bones basic. Look up square foot gardening if that's something that you might be interested in. The third thing is soil quality. Say you go and you find in your backyard the perfect spot, you know, it's got nice sunlight, a little bit of shade in the afternoon so things don't get scorched, etc, etc. And you dig up a 4 by 4 plot of your grass and you turn it over and you're like, hmm, what is this stuff under here? This doesn't look like the dirt that I expected. You need to make sure that your soil quality is good. Um, my soil quality is not so good. I'm slowly building it up and improving it year after year by adding more composted material, whether that's manure from my chickens or uh, cow manure, or whether it's compost from my actual compost bin or even bought in the compost, although I have a tendency to be cheap. Um, another place that I dig up good soil is from under my pine trees as the needles have decomposed over the last several decades. Um, it's left me with some pretty decent fluffy soil so I can kind of treat with that. But if you get to your soil and you're like, wow, this is hard as a rock. It feels like clay, like squishy Play-Doh clay. You're going to want to add um, a good soil. Potting soil in a bag? Perfect. Um, same if it's too sandy and it drains out too fast and it doesn't hold water. That's not a problem where I am, but I know in a lot of places that is a problem. You basically want something a little bit in the middle. Um, something that earthworms love to crawl through and it's kind of fluffy, kind of like brown sugar feeling. Okay? Maybe, maybe not quite brown sugar, that's a little bit more sandy, but a little thicker and juicier than brown sugar. All right. The fourth part is just to get planting. There are so many things that you could get into and say, oh, I don't know if I'm doing it right. I don't know if I'm doing it right. I don't know if I'm doing it right. You know what? 
I had volu I had a volunteer tomato grow in my fuchsia plant last summer. Hanging off my front porch. I had a volunteer tomato plant. I did not plant it. It planted itself by being mixed in with compost or something. And it grew. <laughs> um, plants are a lot hardier than you think you are, or they are. And um, they'll probably be fine. Stick a seed in the ground. Follow the seed pack instructions on the back. And miracle of life. It should do just fine. And if it doesn't, that's not your fault. That's just how it works sometimes. Don't be afraid to plant stuff. Don't be afraid to put seeds into the ground. Who cares if it's the right way or the wrong way? That's the way we learn. One thing to keep in mind is your frost dates. So you don't want to start um, tomatoes or something like that um, from like starts like you might buy in a greenhouse. You don't want to put those out before your last frost date because if it freezes one night, then you are going to have one limp dead tomato plant. Um, but we will get to that at the end. What if you do that? All right. So it's actually not that hard to get growing. If seed starting is intimidating to you, go to a greenhouse, go to a nursery. Um, local is best because they will tend to have knowledgeable people who, who can give you tips on, um, how exactly to handle them and everything. Plus they've done the hardening off for you and everything. And it's a little bit easier for those who are just starting. All right. So any other beginning gardening questions that I haven't answered in that, uh, go ahead and leave them in the comments and I'll come back and answer. Um, some people are just going from growing a few things last year to expanding their garden. And I recommend you kind of go through the same list. What do you want to grow? Where do you want to grow it? Is the soil good enough? And then just do it. The worst thing that can happen is you grow way too much and you got a lot of free food for somebody or compost for next year. Or you get nothing and you go to the grocery store. So you can't really lose. It's all a wonderful experience and it's all good. So you can do it. Let's move on to some requests that we had over in um, Instagram land. Let me get a little sip of this tea. I'll tell you what I think. Actually, not bad. I've been taking dandelion root and milk thistle. And I think it's helping my nausea. They say that if you support the liver, it's supposed to help with nausea. So, here's hoping. All right. Here are some of the requests. We, somebody asked if I could talk about growing root vegetables because I hadn't had a whole lot of luck with them. Uh, carrots, beets, radishes, anything that kind of grows under the ground. Uh, potatoes are kind of a whole different animal, so I won't touch on them because they weren't talking about potatoes. That will be a different topic for a different day, okay? Um, growing root vegetables. Let me tell you, I'm the first one to say my soil being that it is so clay, um, I have had an absolutely horrendous time growing root vegetables as well. And it's really, it's because my soil is so compacted that the plants have to work so hard to get underneath that it's just almost impossible. This year, since my husband is not so interested in using his raised beds for himself, um, I decided to plant our family's vegetables in there because he has a good foot of loose soil in there. And that's going to really help because that loose soil will pull apart as the beet is growing larger and as the carrot is growing down deeper and as the radishes are using that top layer. And that's really going to help to protect them also from rodents that can come and burrow underneath and eat them from underneath uh and slugs and things like that using a raised bed um i don't have very many raised beds because i'm cheap i don't like to put a whole lot of money into something um if i feel like i can do it in a way that's already established which is why most of mine is in ground 
But if you have some raised beds, that would be an excellent way to grow root vegetables because it's just a lot easier. It's kind of like when your kids start to outgrow shoes, you don't keep them in that size small of shoe. You give them a size larger of shoe so that their feet can expand, you know? So same thing with root vegetables. So I'm hoping that this year I do better with my root vegetables instead of trying to force my ground open with those beets and carrots and things like that. I'm going to be using my, I'm going to be continuing to treat my in-ground garden so that eventually I can get to that point. Another request was, what if you don't have a whole lot of space? What can you tell me about vertical gardening? Um, vertical gardening is definitely something that you should consider if you don't have a lot of space. Um, but there are some considerations that you need to take. Um, number one, you need to make sure that any container that you have that is, you know, for vertical, vertical gardening, um, you want to make sure that it has enough soil in it. I've seen these gardening hacks where they use like a, a shoe organizer that goes on a door and they fill it with dirt and they put herbs in there and that drives me absolutely up the wall because it's not enough soil and the soil that is in there is going to be depleted of its nutrients so fast and it's usually got light permeating it and it's going to shrivel all the roots um and the other thing is it just is going to dry out so ridiculously fast um a lot of dollar stores and other places have these um three bumped little stacking trays and you just alternate them and i have some of those i'm going to be using this year um but i'll probably just be growing smaller things like herbs and things like that in that because you need to consider the amount of space there is for roots to grow um you may be able to grow some like dwarf cherry tomatoes or something like that in there. But you would not want to grow um, things like carrots. Uh, <laughs> you would not want to grow things like zucchini, um, etc. in there. Vertical gardening. Another, another way that you can do vertical gardening. I mentioned that, that tomato that took root in my fuchsia plant. Um, that would have actually turned out just fine if I was great about watering that dang poor fuchsia plant. Um, it had enough soil because the pot was a decent size and it would have done just fine hanging. Um, and then you, I could have even stacked several underneath and just done like pot, 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 etc. Um, but vertical gardening, raised bed gardening, potted gardening, all of those require a huge amount more water than you would expect for in ground or like raised beds that are close to the ground. You need to be on top of your watering. You really don't let it get dry too much because once the top layer is dry, chances are the rest of it is drying out rapidly too because it's being heated and dried from all sides, not just the top. So when you're going to be using vertical gardening, make sure that there's enough space for the roots and enough soil and make sure that you are constantly um, in tune with the watering and that also means you need to constantly be in tune with how much nutrients are left in it because as you're watering you're also flushing nutrients out um, you could put like a water catchment underneath so that you can just keep rewatering with that water as it flows out and that would help retain some of your nutrients Another request we had was growing great tomatoes. Tomatoes are fantastic. I love tomatoes. I have a hundred plants ready in here and I know I'm going to have room for a little bit more in my garden um, because of the style how I plant and so I am not going to be able to resist going to the nursery and picking out a few fun ones. Um, but growing great tomatoes, the first step is picking a tomato type that is going to be best for you. What does a great tomato mean to you? Do you mean that you really like those little cute, juicy cherry tomatoes and you just, those are just the, your favorite part of the salad in the summer? Then you need to find a really good quality cherry tomato. Um, read the back. Does it describe it as 
extra sweet or extra crisp or extra juicy or fleshy or what? How does it describe it? Um, if you are into slicing tomatoes, I really do recommend the brandy wines. Brandy wines are really good. I love any of the types of brandy wine. There's pink, there's red, there's yellow, there's all sorts. Um, brandy wine tomatoes, great for slicing. Love them. Um, what if you're doing sauce? Is a great tomato a sauce? Tomato Romas, um, Amish paste, uh, San Marzano's, or the American equivalent are all good. Uh, sauce tomatoes. I prefer Romas. I feel like they're a little bit more, um, but they have broader applications. I can use aroma for slicing. I can put it in salads. I can put it on sandwiches. I can use it for sauce. I can do it for anything. So about 50 of my tomatoes are Romas. And then about 40, no, 30 are the brandy wines and about 20 are cherry tomatoes. Another fun tomato to grow are yellow pear tomatoes, if you like something with a little less acidity. Um, so those are some good choices for types. Now, when it comes to actually growing the tomatoes, um, I'll try and do this really quick because this could be a whole video on its own. Um, you want to plant your, plant your seedling or start or whatever into the ground and make sure to give it a good helping of fertilizer or nutrients, however you work that, compost tea, whatever works for you. And then as the tomato plant is growing, um, any leaves that reach down and touch the soil, you're going to want to cut those off, okay? If it reaches down and touches the soil, that makes it easier for pests to get involved, makes it easier for dirt and mud to cake on the leaves and stop the photosynthesis and it just it sends the energy to the wrong part of the plant so you're going to want to nip anything off that comes down and touches the bottom and then another thing that you're going to do is on your plants um tomatoes okay here this is tomato uh you get a branch right here and then this one's going to come and produce some leaves and some flowers and then some fruit and then up here there's another branch and stuff like that whatever but once in a while you get a sneaky one that's growing right out of the crotch of that and uh, you want to just nip that off. Those are called suckers and they don't do anything good for you except that you can replant them and grow more tomatoes. Um, but you don't want them growing right there. It's spreading out the nutrients too much um, and it's not forcing good tomatoes, it's just forcing extra leaf growth. Uh, you can also make sure you get a good tomato feeding nutrient. I have one that's specifically for tomatoes. It really helps to um, add that a couple times in the season. Helps them to get the nutrients that they need to get those nice juicy tomatoes. The next one is about pruning. Now I will actually reference a different video on this. And I will do my very best to just link it. Um, but I talked about how I prune my little new cherry tree and how I prune my ridiculously overgrown apple tree and how I prune my neglected grapevines. Um, the short version is no more than a third of the plant at a time. Uh, you want to be able to get some air in between it. I've heard it throw a hat through it or throw a cat through it. Um, I'm not going to be throwing any cats anytime soon so I'm going to have to work with a hat. Um, you want to um, make sure that when you're pruning trees and things that if they have suckers growing up from the bottom that you want to get rid of those because that's growing from the rootstock and it's not going to produce the same kind of fruit which is grafted onto most modern fruit trees. Um, but there is another video where I talk about that a little bit more and I'll do my very best to get it. Um, otherwise, just watch all my videos and figure it out for yourself. Just kidding. The last one here from the request is decorating your home. So, <laughs> this is how I decorate my home. Just whatever I love and whatever I need. I've got religious items everywhere. I've got school stuff everywhere. I have, <laughs> I have functioning decorations too. I have a whole bunch of canning stuff that I have hanging on my wall because I use the canning racks and stuff in my cooking. And then I just hang it back on my wall. And I'm like, oh. It's so pretty. All right. 
That's my decorating. And then, here, let's see if I can get you there. My kids' pictures on the walls. Odds and ends. That's my decorating. We're about 25 minutes in. Um, well, unless I edited and added a little bit or took some away. Let's talk about our favorite drinks. Just for fun. I asked everybody on my Instagram page what their favorite drinks were. And uh, we've got a nice little tally here to see what everyone's favorite drinks in the garden are. You're out in the garden, and I guess I didn't specify it was a hot or cold day. But tied for first place is water and iced tea. Um, that was the very first place, and that's pretty much me too. Although I will admit, I'm more of an iced tea person. Um, water on its own has a tendency to make me kind of gag, which is sad. It's water. It should be pleasant, but just some weak iced tea and I'm happy. For second place, we've got lemonade. Um, also mixed in there is lemon water. In third place... We've got coffee. Uh, some are liking it hot and some are liking it cold. For fourth place, we have different pops and different alcohols. Seltzers and beers and things like that. Pepsi, Diet Pepsi. In fifth place, hot tea and hot cocoa. Um, on those cooler days, yeah, I could see hot tea and hot cocoa, especially right now. So, I feel like you can tell what zone people are in by what kind of drinks that they like to enjoy in their garden. Here's another one I have. Do you trust other people to weed your garden? Someone says, hey, I weeded your garden for you. You go, oh, thanks, that's so great. Now I don't have to do that. Let's go and have lunch. Or do you go, hey, thanks. I'm just going to go take a look at what a wonderful job you did. 87% do not trust other people to weed their garden, and I don't blame them. All right. <laughs> uh, let's see. We're going to talk about canning staples. We're going to talk about perennials, managing pests, and then we're finally on to the second page. Canning staples, I put a poll up there to see um, if you could only grow one, what would you grow? I had sweet corn, green beans, carrots, and beets. I was the only one that wanted beets. Do you know why? Because I have a hard time growing sweet corn. Um, my kids don't eat canned green beans, but they love fresh and frozen. And uh, same thing with the carrots. They like them fresh. They don't like them cooked. Um, unless I'm doing my brown sugar, cinnamon, salt, pepper, uh, candied carrots. They do like those. Those are good. Those win every time. But if you're wanting to can vegetables, low acid vegetables, you got a pressure canner or whatever, um, consider doing sweet corn, consider doing green beans, and consider doing carrots. Uh, those are really great staples that you can add to almost any meal, really. You can add the corn to chili or soups. You can have it as a side, etc. Green beans, again, great side dish. Carrots, you can add them to soups, you can add them to casseroles, etc. Having all of those for canning purposes is a fantastic thing to have. And I try every year to grow that sweet corn. Um, I have had much better luck with green beans and carrots so far, but the, we got earwigs here and they just love my sweet corn. And no matter what I do, they seem to just be just horrible. We'll get to the managing pests. Let's talk about perennials real briefly here. Uh, do you have a perennial section? It's good to have a section of your garden for perennials instead of having perennials scattered throughout. Because as you're moving things around for your annual garden, um, you don't want to accidentally disrupt your perennials. And I know this from experience because the people who lived here, couple owners before us, had planted rhubarb in the backyard. And what a wonderful plant to have. Uh, the only problem is that the rhubarb is planted right where my annual garden is. And every time that we've tilled, uh, we've nicked it. And 
yes, I could put a sign up, don't till in this area, and I've tried that, but then it somehow gets disturbed anyway. Um, so instead of continuing to grow the rhubarb there, my hope is to train, uh, to turn the front part of my house into a perennial section of asparagus, strawberries, uh, other berry bushes like blueberries, raspberries, they'll be in a slightly different part. Um, any perennial herbs that will keep coming up even despite our cold winters. Um, rhubarb, I want to get out there. And um, any other little perennials that I know that I can plant once and kind of forget about, I want to have it all in one section so that I'm not constantly disturbing it with digging and moving and stepping and playing with and adding things that they don't like. Pardon me. Perennials are great because pardon, they are low maintenance once you get them started. Okay. Let's talk about managing pests real quick. Most people said that they would prefer to manage pests in a way that is natural. Uh, picking them off and flicking them into some soapy water. I bring a little cup of uh, soapy water out to the garden with me in the morning oftentimes and I just flick the bugs into them and then uh, drain it out and toss them to the chickens once they're dead. That does help, especially with like Japanese beetles and things like that. Um, I've also used neem oil, which seemed to help a little bit on the corn last year. I had my oldest go out and spray with neem oil and um, there's another one that I'm not going to remember. If I remember, I'll put it in the comments. Um, and that helped to reduce the amount of earwigs and things. Um, sometimes pest management means moving your stuff to another area. I'm going to be planting my squash in the front instead of the back because I have squash vine borers, uh, the squash bugs, and I've got, here's another one that attacks squash. And they're all there. And they're all just destroying every type of squash that I plant. It's, it's, it's apocalyptic. So they're going to go in the front and hopefully give the backyard a couple of years to allow the bugs to die off. Um, you can spray some toxic stuff on your garden, but isn't that kind of what we're trying to get away from here in home gardening? That said, uh, an application of pesticides at the right time will can, can help. I'm considering spraying my apple tree this year with something. I'm not sure yet what, um, because I'd like to actually enjoy my apples. All right, let's get over to the next page. It looks like a lot, but actually it's just big writing. Let's talk about favorite herbs. Um, I polled everybody, what are your favorite herbs to plant? Oregano won by, like, by uh, leaps and bounds. Everyone liked to grow oregano, and I can see why. Oregano, once you get it in the ground, it just kind of goes. You don't have to worry about it too much, and you can put, use it in lots of different applications. In some climates, it'll just keep growing and growing and growing through the winter or bring itself back. Um, mine is not one of those climates. I do have to replant it every year, but it's a very good, uh, herb to have around for all sorts of things, including medicinals. In second place, we had basil. There are lots of different varieties of basil and basil is very useful in Italian and Indian cooking. In third place was thyme. Um, and thyme is great in American style, like chicken cooking and cooking and things like that, as well as Italian, and it can be great in blends. In the fourth place, we've got sage and rosemary. And honestly, I kind of think it was because everyone remembered parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. But sage and rosemary are also very common herbs uh, to grow. Sage is, in my experience, very easy to grow. Rosemary, not quite as easy, but very, um, it is something that everybody wants. All right. In fifth place, we had a tie between lavender, parsley, and dill. Um, now this is where I vary from everybody. 
My number one is dill because I love to make pickles every year and I use so much dill. I use so much dill because I like some really dill dilly pickles. So that's my number one. And then the rest tied for sixth place, mint, lemon balm, yarrow, which I really do want to grow, but I can't find the seeds for. Cilantro, marjoram, parsley, and chives. All right. We talked about mushrooms a little bit. He said, do you like mushrooms? Do you hate mushrooms? And um, about three quarters of people love mushrooms. Um, and I won't touch on it too, too hard here, but you can grow mushrooms at home. Um, there's kits that you can use to get started in it. Um, and they're fantastic. They're great. Um, and being able to have those mushrooms near you instead of having to go and forage or go and buy them at the store is really convenient. So, plus it's, it's fun to learn a new skill that's different than regular gardening. It's producing food, but in a different way. Let's talk about chickens real quick. And then we'll get to the oops I planted too soon. Um, I had somebody come and ask me, oh no, my three-week-old chickens, um, one of them's bloody. What, what's going on? And a lot of people, when they get chickens, don't know about pecking order. Pecking order means who's boss. Now, chickens, when they're younger and then as they age and as you add new chickens to their group, will peck at each other and kind of beat each other up a little bit in order to establish who is the strongest, who gets to eat first, who gets to drink first, etc. And the weakest ones are oftentimes beat up. Um, if you don't have enough resources for all of those chickens to feel like they have enough and they don't need to fight for every grain and every drink, then uh, you can have a much more calm flock. Um, and it's easy to have to get kind of caught up in spreading your resources too thin when they're chicks and they're growing into their pecking order now. So it, it's fine. There's no problem with it. You just have to work to um, get them better resources spread out. And some chickens, like silkies, have a tendency to be the ones that are preyed upon. Um, oftentimes people have special coops for their silkies that are separate, um, so that they are not picked on quite as much. If you get a chicken with an injury, um, if it's something that you would, on your body, would wash and put a band-aid on, or one of those, uh, steri strips where it stretches it and keeps it closed, um, then... You don't need to worry about it too much on a chicken. You could treat it if you'd like to. Put some antibiotic ointment with no pain relief um, on it. Keep it clean. Maybe give the chicken a couple days because chickens will continue to peck at that one if they see the blood. Give it a couple days to kind of heal up and then you can reintroduce it to the flock in a, in a safe manner. Um, if you see that there's a chicken that's getting really beat up, you may choose to separate that chicken from the flock until it is doing better. Maybe give it a docile buddy to keep it company. Um, or you may choose to find the aggressor. Because oftentimes, just because the one chicken is being picked on doesn't mean it's the weak link. It means that there is an aggressive chicken that needs to be cut out of the flock. So you can kind of go about it both ways. You can either save the victim, or persecute the suspect. So, um, Another thing is that I learned that one of my chickens has a very fluffy bottom and has been caked with stinkiness. Um, when you notice that a chicken has bad personal hygiene on her, on her nether regions, um, you need to take care of it. So that's my thing tomorrow morning. Um, I need to go take care of that chicken. She's a friendly chicken, so it shouldn't be too hard. Um, basically, I'm going to give her a haircut on her butt. Um, <laughs> cutting the feathers doesn't hurt as long as you're not cutting way too close to the skin. Um, you know, about right there, so maybe even a little closer. Um, 
I'm going to just trim it off, get all the mud and anything else that's caked on there, and to clean her up. And then it's kind of cold here. I'm not going to wash her, but if it was warmer, I probably would. Um, but while I'm there, I need to inspect to make sure that there's no cuts. Um, the other chickens have not been picking at her bottom. Um, that there's nothing that indicates an injury. Because if there is an injury at the vent, which is the chicken's bottom, um, it can make the chicken sick very quickly. Um, and you would want to treat that, which sometimes has an egg withdrawal, which means you can't eat their eggs. And if you don't know which one are their eggs, then you can't eat any of the eggs, etc. So you want to make sure that their hygiene is managed as best as you can. Um, and if, if she is going to be sick, uh, or uh, rather what I should say is, if it was summer um, and we had more flies, that's something to be concerned about because the flies can land and lay eggs and create an absolute disgusting mess of that poor chicken's bottom. Now, I have about two minutes left on my phone's memory. So let's talk about, oops, planted my plants out too soon. How can I save them? I had somebody who planted her stuff too soon. Um, and it was actually her, her husband wanted to be helpful and didn't realize that they weren't quite hardened off yet. And he planted everything out and she's like, Oh no, they're not, they're not ready. It's they're, they're babies yet. Um, what you can do is cloche them, um, get some milk jugs or anything else similar and basically make little greenhouses over them. Um, take them off in the heat of the day so that they're not wilting down. Um, put them on in the, you know, kind of late afternoon so that they maintain some heat during the night. Um, if you know that you're going to be inundated with a windstorm, give them some protection, put that milk jug on it, and then weigh that milk jug down somehow so that they're not being blown to smithereens. Basically, you just want to protect them until they get used to it. Expect some stunting. Don't expect them to produce too quickly um, because they've been kind of shocked, and that's okay. They will recover. It'll just take a little bit of time. Thanks for joining me here on uh, Coffee in the Garden, and I hope that was a very informative episode, and I hope I didn't rattle off things too quickly. I had a lot to cover today, and um, I've really enjoyed doing this with everybody. Hopefully next week, I keep saying this, hopefully next week we'll be actually in the garden, and maybe actually with some coffee, because I do love coffee. Just can't quite stomach it yet. All right, so may God bless you all. And I hope that I can see you next week. And in the meantime, come chat with me. Ask me any questions you guys have. I love helping people. Um, makes my days go by faster and uh, more enjoyably. God bless you. Bye-bye.